Hello, everyone. Hi, Dana. Hi, Gil. Hey. Hi. How's it going? Good. Uh, excited to dig in here. <laughs> yeah. So thank you, audience members, as well, for, for joining us. We have a wonderful session for you today. We have Dana Oshiro, the general partner at HeavyBit, who's going to be talking about software-defined movements and the power of community. So it's really interesting. I know it's very top of mind for a lot of our portfolio companies, and I'm sure for a lot of other startups as well. Um, so Dana, thanks again. We know you're super busy, so we really appreciate you being here. Thanks for having me. Yeah, so just to uh, maybe introduce Dana a bit. Um, I've known Dana for a few years now and I've been very impressed with, with her and the, the whole team at HeavyBit. Um, Dana, you're actually Canadian originally, right? I am, yep. Right. <laughs> uh, so, um, and then you, you moved to SF, you worked as a tech journalist for nine years, um, uh, published in New York Times, Wall Street Journal, uh, Mashable. Um, you're also, interestingly, marketing director at an Israeli company called Fixia, which is actually a deal that I looked at at the seed stage um, like many, many years ago. Um, you did marketing for a bunch of companies, um, I guess, as a, more of a, as a consultant, right? Um, including Salesforce, yeah. Roku, and um, uh, Code, Code for America, um, and then uh, joined Heavybit um, pretty early on in, in Heavybit's life. Um, uh, and um, heavy bit for those of you that don't know, and we'll we'll ask Dana obviously to tell a little about it. But it's 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 a pretty cool accelerator slash fund uh, based in the Bay Area, focused on 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 dev heavy sort of dev dev tool centric dev centric startups. Um, and when really like in, in 2014, 2015, 2016, when heavy was getting started, um, was really you know pretty unique and alone in the world, and really providing the the support that those kind of founders needed. Um, and it was really impressive to watch. Um, to, uh, by now, Heavybit is both an accelerator and a fund. Um, some very, very impressive startups in the portfolio, including a bunch of Israeli startups that I know of. I'm assuming you have some European startups in your portfolio as well. I don't, I don't know if you do or not, but I'm assuming you do. Um, yeah. We look at deals together all the time. Uh, we haven't yet done one together, but I'm still hopeful that that happens soon. Um, and uh, actually, no, you, you guys are involved in Sneak, right? So we're, we do have some, some overlap, at least with my, my track record. Um, but just maybe before we get into the, the talk, um, I'd, I'd love to hear a bit more about your origin story as a, as a VC slash startup person, having started as a journalist um, in Canada or come from Canada, moved to the Bay Area, started as a journalist. Can you tell us how that took place and how you find yourself now running uh, one of my favorite VCs in San Francisco. Yeah, uh, uh, it's a, a long and circuitous journey. I totally am not the like sort of classic person that came up through like a Stanford MBA and a McKinsey background or something like that. Um, uh, the way that I got to heavy bit was um, I met James through Heroku. Um, and, you know, and the reason I got into startups and dev tool startups in general is because um, I actually had a background more in like um, the marketing side of things. And I was looking at, at this like mass proliferation of, the, of, of people just talking online and talking in different ways. And it wasn't really like a traditional media landscape. And, you know, as far as um, developer marketing is concerned, that's kind of always been the case, like the way that you learn about the new technologies that are, you know, going to take over the world. It's not necessarily the tech crunches of the world that like break that story. It's like in the threads, right? It's in the Reddit and, and Hacker News and um, all these different places where you find this information out. So I was looking at a lot of this new marketing and community building. And then um, James recruited me to come into heavy bit. And what I was doing there was building out the accelerator program, which was effectively identifying people who were like noticeable voices within different developer communities, and then bringing them in as advisors to work with our companies. Um, so that's kind of how it all started. I think it came in through a side door and it is like um, more of like an educational role than I'd say a, a traditional VC role. Um, and then from there, I've you know, the program is gone through a bunch of different iterations. Um, it's been six years now. And so I'm moving over more to the investment side, vetting deals, doing all the things that you would normally do in a, in a traditional VC. But because Heavy Bit started as an accelerator, I think that's always kind of where our hearts lie. And 
frankly, it's probably one of the differentiators for us, which is like building up, you know, 700 advisors that are all uh, very domain specific to developer tools. For those who don't know Heavybit, would you be um, willing to kind of dive a little bit deeper and talk about um, Heavybit and how it functions and also potentially how it's changed during the pandemic and how you're planning on operating it post COVID? Yeah, um, so we started as an accelerator um, in the very early days that um, had to do with like a physical location and a lot of people um, would move into the building and work from there. Um, and it was great um, and it was correct for the time. Uh, and, you know, we run office hours and advisor hours, workshops, all of these things internally that I think the general public doesn't see. Um, and then externally we run uh, speaker series, large conferences, um, a bunch of public events that are more for the general um, founder community, um, not necessarily deep diving into each individual piece for our member companies. Um, but like we run a thing that has only eight to 10 companies that we work with per year. So uh, behind the scenes, there's a lot of very specific like bespoke work that we do with our companies. Um, today, you know, and, and, and like post pandemic, um, we have kind of evolved beyond that building. Um, so we had already started doing uh, remote office hours and, and partner hours and, and all of those things with our companies um, in 2016 when we started working with Sneak. Uh, and so we didn't really have to change a ton of stuff around that. Um, behind the scenes, it was the public events that actually changed, right? And so uh, we're uber conscious now of like the time at which we should be um, publishing things online or in which we should have live streams. We're uber conscious of what it's like to work asynchronously across multiple time zones. Um, we probably, I think 60% of our portfolio even before the pandemic was outside of the US, um, not just the Bay Area. So uh, it has been, you know, it's been a tough transition in just figuring out what the different formats are gonna be and the, what the, different, um, the different ways of communicating would be. Uh, but it wasn't as as huge of a transition as what others might have had. And just um, one last question before we dive into your talk. Um, you talked about heavy bit being sort of correct for the time back then and, and evolving. Um, the DevOps world, being a founder in the DevOps world, you know, it feels completely different now than it did in 20. 14, 2015. I'd, I'd love your perspective on that. I mean, that, that's, you know, it's so, it's so much faster now. It's so much more accepted now. Um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, how, how, how has it changed? Yeah. We could go on for like an hour about this. Uh, <laughs> so, I mean, I think at the time, um, 2013, 2014, you saw, um, uh, you saw like early adopt early enterprise adopters of for cloud ar architecture, right? So you saw a lot of conversations around cloud and hybrid cloud. Um, people were talking a lot about um, Docker and Mesosphere and and core OS. Um, and uh, but but at the same time, it was like still early adoption for enterprise. And so. Uh, Frankly, there were a lot of VCs and press that just thought you couldn't make money in developer tools or um, you couldn't make money that way. And you know, now um, I think that there, there's like a real change um, and um, you know, it's multifold. First of all, we just, uh, we're, we just saw a forced late stage adoption of enterprises for cloud, right? And so companies like Sneak um, did amazingly well you know, surprisingly in the middle of this period of like huge, whatever digital transformation that you call it or cloud transformation. I think uh, since then you've seen the IPOs of Twilio, Fastly, PagerDuty, um, like Snowflake, Datadog. Uh, so no one's questioning whether you can make money in developer tools or in enterprise B2B in that way. And then there are still bigger security and orchestration and management problems around all of this that need solving, right? So there's still a startup ecosystem around it, but really developers are different as well. Um, I think the definition of developers is broadened in some ways, um, well, in many ways, um, 
you saw the proliferation of JavaScript frameworks. And so that um, opened it up to a lot of new um, folks. You see low code and no code. Um, yeah, I think, you know, it's it you're seeing the evolution of um, you're seeing what cloud architecture looks like at scale with later stage adoption. Cool. Um, so just as a reminder to the audience, um, as, as you come up with questions, please click the raise hand button so that Anne and I can bring you into the conversation. Uh, and with that, uh, Dana, we'd love to you know, hear your thoughts on soft, soft, software defined movements. The, the title is very intriguing and I, I feel like that captures a lot of stuff that we try to tell our companies and I, I, uh, I'm absolutely looking forward to hearing how awesome. you thought about this. Yeah, uh, I hope if I live up to expectations here. Um, but if not, we can continue the conversation afterwards and, and yeah, keep going. Um, so uh, as Gail said, I'm gonna talk about software defined movements. Um, you know, let's see. A um, little bit of background on heavy bit um, and kind of, you know, we talked a little bit about the um, international uh, uh, piece of, of all of this. Um, really, we help seed and series A developer and enterprise companies scale their go-to market. Um, we've worked with tons of globally distributed founders and advisors, and our partnership includes the co-founders of Heroku, Chef, and Librato, folks who've built really vibrant developer-led communities and products. Uh, this is our portfolio. Um, you probably recognize some of the folks in here. Um, the common problem that I hear amongst folks, especially when I'm working with them on taking their products to market, is that before direct selling, they have to educate around best practices and much larger concepts. So PagerDuty had to talk about DevOps, Stripe had to talk about APIs, Lightstep talked about tracing. You know, as companies join um, Heavybit, they've often teamed up to share and educating around best practices. And then those common practices become what I am calling software defined movements. So this is me introducing the concept of software defined movements. Um, it's really where you educate and empower a specific type of developer while also building your commercial uh, product and go-to market. So think um, DevSecOps, Jamstack, observability, no company really owns these things specifically, but they required significant education to sell into them. When the concepts gain traction, that's when the startup ecosystems emerge. So, of course, there are early players and commercial winners. You know, Net Netlify um, is synonymous with Jamstack. Sneak is synonymous with DevSecOps, Honeycomb and Observability. Um, I'm kind of here to convince you that I believe that the best go-to markets embrace software-defined movements and the founder's role as an educator and advocate before selling. So this is Edith Harbo. Uh, she's an alumni of Heavybit, and she's this is her mentoring Heavybit founders. Um, she's the CEO of LaunchDarkly, and they're a feature management platform. Uh, today, LaunchDarkly has more than 1,300 customers. They're on the Forbes Cloud 100. Um, they raised more than a million, $100 million in funding. Um, but five years ago, when we first started working with Edith, it was incredibly hard to sell feature management because it was really only common amongst large organizations like Facebook. Um, Edith produced a lot of talks and content specifically um, not to talk about launch darkly, but to educate around CI, CD, and release management best practices. And then this allowed her to build trust in, in which she could in, introduce this like concept of feature flagging as a service. There's a lot of benefits to the approach for her. Um, she was able to validate the problem. So from TripIt, she'd already built in-house feature management, um, but by talking with others, she could also um, see how common this problem was amongst others. Um, she identified a bunch of partners, so she found adjacent partners invested in CICD and partnered on um, events and, and content. Um, to this day, she's still running a podcast called To Be Continuous with the co-founder of Circle CI, um, Paul Bigger, and it's probably one of our most popular podcasts on, on the Heavybit network. And then um, lastly, she isolated the name for what she was actually working on. Um, I think a lot of people don't realize that um, feature flagging wasn't necessarily the first thing that she wanted to go with um, when she was talking about this problem that she was solving, right? Like they named the company Launch Darkly. It would have been so easy to just call it Dark Launches. 
but she tested multiple messages. She tested canary releases, dark launches, feature flagging, and feature flagging was really what stuck. And so she went with it and, and that has allowed her to better explain um, what LaunchDarkly is um, solving and to better explain um, how they can help others. And so let's get into it, right? The, the five patterns um, in those who've built and leveraged Groundswell developer and software defined movements. Um, things that I've learned from folks like Edith include um, identifying the change in the industry, helping the forgotten devs who are affected by that change, having an opinion and giving it a name, honoring the past and socializing new ways of working, and then building community and implementing hero making. So let's start with change. Um, yeah, as you all probably know, the software industry is ever evolving for every change. There's a set of tools and workflows that effectively become obsolete, right? So we see change like architectural changes like cloud native microservices. We see changes like practices, um, you know, the move from waterfall to agile or Git workflows. Um, we see regulatory changes like GDPR, or CCPA, and some of the federal things that are coming down the pipe. Um, but the point is, things change. There's a global narrative here that is much larger than your company or your ability to sell. And what was once a decent way of doing things has now ballooned into something really, really unwieldy. So train, change um, happens and then it results in a group of underserved developers. Um, I think folks, uh, older folks are uh, familiar with this um, picture and it's Adrian Cockcroft's hairball of microservices from Netflix. Uh, this, what he's, what he's showing here is that there was a change from monolithic to microservice architecture, that developers suffered new complexity and problems, things like orchestration and visibility. Um, they schlepped through ad hoc workflows and Frankenstein together tooling to make it work. And they wasted time from their core jobs and products with no real alternative. Um, you probably see forgotten devs in your own domain, right? You see folks on Reddit and Stack Overflow and Hacker News threads cobbling together homegrown solutions. You see common support tickets at your last job that you were never really able to close. Um, and you see social criticism of large companies about gaps in service. Um, there's a Stuart Brand quote um, where he says that once a new technology rolls over you, if you're not part of a steamroller, you're part of the road. So forgotten developers are really an opportunity for startups, um, not for a quick sale, but to educate, support, and empower them. And you know, I think the best software-defined movements start with an opinion. Um, so this first one on the left is the Agile Manifesto. Um, it's a real, like, in my day, uh, the Agile Manifesto uh, was put out in 2001, and it's a document that sounded a lot like democracy and optimism, but it, it was really educating around iterative design, um, continuous development, and eventually elevated DevOps as a discipline. Um, this wasn't the only opinion or manifesto at this time, but for me, it was um, the first time I'd seen someone give a name to the change and the problem and the solution. It was released as a short post with multiple co-signers and went on, um, and those co-signers went on to evangelize the correct way to build via O'Reilly Talks, essays, and press. You know, later you see documents like 12 Factor App by Heroku's Adam Wiggins, informed by the Ruby on Rails community. And then more recently in 2016, I had the pleasure of working with Netlify's co-founders on Jamstack. Jamstack is, um, is like a community, but it also is um, a state of building in which you argue for the separation of front end from build process for faster and better sites and web apps. Uh, and for those who don't know, um, Netlify, uh, the group that originally coined that term, helps developers build, deploy, and host static sites and web apps. So the man in, this, in the middle of this photo is Matthias Billman. He's the co-founder of Netlify. Um, just take a look at his body language. He's not someone who is a loud mouth or a bragger. And honestly, he'd be very embarrassed to be considered a thought leader. Um, but in 2016, this was the guy who spoke to 800 plus front end web developers at Smashing Comp. And he was terrified just asking them to consider a new way of working in a new term for their work. This was Jamstack. 
For the first time in my career, I was watching someone socialize a new concept in a naming convention in real time to a live audience. And frankly, he succeeded. Um, watch the talk. Uh, there's a link in the corner of this as well. I can share it afterwards, but um, it is awesome. He does a lot of things very well. Um, he honors those from the past. So he goes way back. He talks about Tim Berners-Lee in the first web web page. He talks about uh, the evolution of static sites, lamp stack developers. You know, and he, he doesn't berate this work. He's honoring it because it was the right work for the time. Uh, he just, he goes on to identify change and complex problems, um, things like security and reliability and performance um, that have become more complex um, as they're have been more developers. And then he introduces new ways, um, you know, a new way of working, um, a new term uh, that turns overwhelmed web developers into modern heroes. Um, and then finally, he, he welcomes feedback from others. Uh, the thing that he doesn't do in this talk is try to sell hard sell like web hosting or deployment tools. Um, today, um, I think Pretty recently, Netlify just celebrated 1 million active developers on platform. Um, and there's many more who are Jamstack converts. So, you know, watch the talk. It's definitely a masterclass in, in both uh, founder bravery and respectfully introducing a new opinion and name. And then this is the part I think where people get really uh, caught up. Um, just because you have an opinion and it's socialized doesn't mean the work is done. Um, people talk a lot about hero making and not that many people do it very well. Um, so I'm going to plug one of my companies that just very recently launched um, Orbit GA last week with their developer relation uh, relationship management tool. And they've done a lot of things very well with this launch. Um, so they identified the change in forgotten developers. Um, you know, even though dev communities are, are now important and they happen in distributed conversations, um, community builders have been using outdated marketing tools to engage um, and prove out their ROI. And, and so this is what something that they're trying to tackle. Um, 18 months ago, before uh, launching to the public, they released the Orbit model as an open repo for feedback uh, to vet metrics and, and to look at product assumptions. Um, and then, you know, finally today, um, they just launched and there's 1500 teams onboarded to Orbit, but even more people engaging with the Orbit model. Um, what they're doing is they're recognizing community leaders in their content and in their um, social media, and they're using, um, they're looking at best practices from these community leaders via like Clubhouse and Twitch and, and their podcasts and their blog posts and using modern tactics, not to sell Orbit, but to lift people up, right? And I think this is something that's really important to point out is that hero making and movement building is, is this like benevolent thing. Um, movements don't happen with one person screaming, uh, like screaming into the wind or, or, or glomming onto a, a, a name and then owning it all for themselves. Um, people now proudly identify as agile, as DevOps, as Jamstack developers. Um, with Orbit, they're focused on community builders, um, not just showing their customer case studies, but they're actually showing great community leaders, even those who aren't using Orbit the product. Um, this creates new respect and pride for um, a type of developer that until now has been ignored. Um, so, you know, I think moving forward, as with all ideas that are big enough, there's going to be others who probably adopt the Orbit model and become ecosystem players. Um, and that's okay. I think good founders understand that software developments are people powered and that they leave room for um, developers and even other startups to shine. My team told me I had to plug this. So uh, if you really want to dig into the tactical aspects of community building and hero making, you just spent the last six years curating 1400 talks and blog posts from really great founders and advisors. Uh, visit heavybit.com slash library to check it out. Um, we'd love your feedback on that. Um, we also just put on a conference called Dev Guild Software Defined Movements. Um, so if you don't believe me, you can believe folks like um, speakers from Netlify, Slack, Ob Zero, HackerOne around um, what it means to build these types of communities. And here's the refresher. Um, Five patterns of software defined movements include identifying change, helping forgotten developers, having an opinion and giving it a name, 
honoring the past and socializing the new and building community via hero making. Um, you know, this is the beginning of something and it's, it's a lot of work, but you know, it's worth it. Um, as a founder, you're eventually gonna have to sell a product. You'll probably do like the first million in sales for your product, but in order to sell, you really, really need to earn trust. And there's really no faster path to trust than making people proud of the work that they do every day. So I'm asking you to identify your software defined movement or movements and ensure that you're educating, supporting and empowering the developers that you plan to sell to. That's kind of it. Um, I know we're gonna jump into Q&A. Um, if I don't answer all the questions today, which I probably won't, feel free to email me at dana at heavybit.com. And then if you wanna call out your own favorite software defined movements, feel free to tweet at me at heavybit or at me or at heavybit. Thanks. Awesome, Dana, thank, thank you so much. Um, lots of food for thought here and, and um, you know, strongly wanna encourage people to, you know, jump in, raise their hands, ask questions. Um, uh, Dana is obviously someone who's who's been at the forefront of, of a lot of these things and, and, and helped a lot of companies navigate these kinds of things. So, so um, it's a, it, it, um, it's a unique opportunity. Um, one, one question I would, I would want to start with Dana is, um, you know, I think as, you know, as VCs, we probably give this advice or some, some form of this advice. Um, and, and, you know, I think we've observed the success of some of these movements. Um, what are the pitfalls of trying to do this? In other words, both, are there companies that you've seen attempt to do this that either don't need to or shouldn't? Um, let, let, actually, let me, let me start with that. What's, what's the litmus test for knowing, are we doing something where we should be thinking about creating a movement or are we doing something where maybe we can, we can just sell and not worry about having the conference and having the yeah yeah i don't think the movement has to be your movement immediately if that makes sense uh mm -hmm. you can look at existing movements that are already out there you can look at major trends that are happening and just add to the conversation there um i mean i think the reality is is that you can't like produce content or stable uh, sales enablement material material in like a vacuum right you need a continuous distribution method uh, in order to be able to bring people in and get them to try, right? And so if you, one of the best ways to do that is to be contributing to, you know, go talk at the Kubernetes meetup or go do whatever you need to do to be able to find the developers that you know you're most likely able to help. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, it's, I mean, it's I think like that's you're, the best you're, advice. You're sort of describing it almost as like currents in the ocean and you need to get on a current or two. Um, yeah. And, and then there's there's companies that seem to be able to create their own currents, or at least something that I observe is companies making the effort to do that, right? It doesn't always work, right? They'll have, like, I'll, I'll sometimes see in my Twitter feed, like some company that I know is really, really small, but they're like inviting the whole world to some conference, right? That's kind of named around what their startup does, right? Um, and, and I sometimes can't tell if that's like brilliant, aggressive movement building, or if that's, just going through the motions and it's it's a silly waste of energy. How, how, how should we think about that? Yeah, um, I mean, I think if nobody else is going to make any money off of the movement, then it's probably not going to work very well. Uh, okay. I, and it, it, does that make sense? Um, like, I think there has to be like a much larger ecosystem that um, comes up around it, right? And so I think there right. are, there's a lot of folks that will look to others to, um, build up uh, whatever educational um, campaign or message that they're hoping to, to you know, move forward. Um, I think back to like the old days at Heroku and, and it was like Heroku Engine, Yard and Pivotal that we're all talking to the Ruby and Rails community um, or, and you know, you wouldn't necessarily think that those would be people that would team up with each other. And certainly at the time, I think Engine, Yard and Heroku were like pitted against each other in many cases, but. Mm -hmm. I think that's okay. You know, you you try to create as much value as you possibly can for the exact developers that you know are your like sort of target persona, initial target persona, and then um, whoever's got the best product after that and the best product uh, developer experience after that is likely to win out. So in other words, the litmus test is it has to be bigger than than you. In other words, I think if it's so. just about your company. 
and that that's a an, an interesting segue into into the next question I want to ask you. And you know, we see this in in a few companies we work with, where they are riding they're riding on the coattails of someone, or someone's already come and said, "Hey, we're we've got this open source thing that we've you know released." Um, and you know whether it's Jamstack or some other thing, and there already is a company that's like the Jamstack company, right? Um, can it work if you're a number two, or does it end up? Yeah, good. Yeah, I think so, and I think that there's like going to be holes in the there's going to be holes, right? Like it, in the ecosystem, like Netlify doesn't cover every single part of the Jamstack. Um, I think there's there's a lot of pieces around it. Um, especially in the kind of like now uh, Jamstack moving in the enterprise side of it that have not yet been solved out or completely, um, yeah, have not yet been completely covered. And so there are opportunities for you to jump in there. Um, I think there's also like when you hit a critical mass of, of movement based, um, yeah, of, of the movement, um, someone, people will come and tear it apart, or there will be new players who will be like, mm, that has ballooned to the point of unwieldy complexity. We're offering the next stack <laughs> or whatever they want, right. X stack, I don't know. Right. Uh, so, it, you know, it, it will always evolve. It, we used, we've used different nomenclature for all of these things and, and at the core of it, like if you've been around long enough, you're like, oh, I know what that is. I know what we used right. to call it or, you know. Right. Yeah, um, yeah, we're we're seeing that a little bit in DBT. In other words, we're 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 looking at some companies in that area, and and there's there's a lot of sort of obsession with Fishtown as like where well, they're the DBT company, right? Um, and and our view is that DBT is such a major shift, such a major in, unlocking of potential that we're really just at the beginning of that. It, it's okay if there's a DBT company because there's going to be many more DBT companies, and that doesn't take away just just like you said, it doesn't take away from what Fishtown has achieved at all. There's plenty of there's so much you know there's what they have done is so remarkable that there's so much opportunity that there's just going to be waves upon waves and sort of it's you create room for new you know uh, I, I don't want to call them micro movements, but they probably start as micro movements and then they kind of become their own movements on top of the bedrock of the previous movements. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, you can look back at a lot of the different, you know, initial like missives and and like um, manifestos that came out. And you can, especially, I don't, I don't think that the first people that were pushing forward the, you know, messages around open source were necessarily the commercial winners. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> You know, I think they're they're famous and and beloved, but uh, I don't know that that's necessarily it, they they aren't necessarily the ones that are now today like at unicorn companies or or have created unicorn companies. Um, it just so, yeah. <laughs> are there any movements um, that you're particularly excited about right now, either that are full fledged or that are in their infancy? that um, you're excited about and, and perhaps why are you excited about them? Yeah, I think that there's, um, I mean, I think that there's still, well, I'm really excited about actually the the um, moving the DevRel folks into this, like um, bringing them into the fold and, and creating like more respect around the work that they do because we put so much emphasis on these dev communities and, and so much emphasis on um, trying to, build out your contributor base and trying to make developers love you. And then we don't give anybody any tools to do that. So that's very exciting. Um, I think lifting up um, folks that are maybe like in the, um, uh, the enterprise side of app development. So um, you see, and not the enterprise side of app development, I guess the enterprise readiness side of app development. Um, so, uh, there is a lot more complexity um, at the app developer layer and at app developer level. And so um, being able to offer them all these like get workflows and things like that in order to be able to deal with, you know, authorization and things like that um, is very, very important. Um, and it was, th it was things that they didn't necessarily have to care about in the past. Um, I don't know. 
Awesome. And we got I was a question. pretty vague. <laughs> I'm, like, <laughs> great I'm like, I'm not ready. I'm not ready to, <laughs> to drop it. Um, so we got a question from Quinn from Helsinki, and it's a it's a broad question, but what are your tips when marketing to developers? Um, well, I mean, I guess everybody talks about like developers hate being marketed to and everybody hates being marketed to when it's done poorly. Um, I guess my tip for marketing to developers is to look for opportunities to add value. And by that, I mean, do not build the listicle conversation that's obviously not going to add to something. Um, I think it's good to be building out educational content and teardowns and um, lifting people up and, and allowing to, them to gain a new level of mastery in the work that they do. Um, like I said, make people proud of the work that they do, right? Awesome. So we got a good question from Asaf Shulman, uh, who's a CMO of Firebolt. And we actually had him on a couple of weeks ago. To, he, he ran an Angular Insight session about how to market a baby unicorn, which is great. Um, anyone on here, definitely recommend checking it out. So he was asking, what are some tips for kickstarting a community around your product slash movement? Yeah, um, I think look for clues. So you you already should know who your core your initial core developer is or the one that you can you know most help. Um, look for the communities that they are already um, they that they are already like contributing to and look for the different conversations that are being had in those communities. And then see first if you can build content or test out some of your ideas in those communities. Uh, if you do see, you know, a lot of good feedback from that, I think that that's a good indicator um, to move forward. Uh, there's a lot of like open source communities that are already, or open source projects that already exist that then back into a commercial product from there. Uh, those folks in many cases have like a pretty decent advantage around it too, because they get all of the feedback around product discovery with the open source product. Um, to inform what their commercial product might look like down the line. Um, and so if the commercial product can become the natural um, additional levels of support, additional levels of, of whatever from this open source community, there's something very interesting there. Um, to what extent, Dana, are these movements, you know, you, we're, we're talking about it as if it's something that's like within the control of these companies. Like to what extent yeah. are these just organic <laughs> things that, that happen, right? And, and, and to what extent can they be orchestrated, right? Because from a from a cold business, like right, there's this there's these two competing things here, right? On the one hand, you have this ideology of open source and developers helping developers, and let's make developers' lives better, and organic communities that sort of emerge around exciting technologies, right? And on the other side of the equation, you have this fairly cynical approach of we're going to own the search term for whatever it is, whether it's Jamstack or whether it's infrastructure as code or whatever you know, movement you're trying to, whatever marketing objective you have. Um, and there's, I think a lot of, uh, you know, I think if we're honest, there's a lot of attempts to orchestrate this from the top down. Um, how do you think about the balance between those two things? Can it work as an orchestrated, you know, companies that raise hundreds of millions of dollars and can spend money on anything, can they, can they force this to happen? Or is it, is it, does it not matter? And it's always the, the teams with no money who are just organically loved by developers that end up becoming the movements? Uh, I think that there is, I mean, the organic piece is your opinion needs to be correct or the movement needs to be somewhat correct and easy to engage with. Uh, the manufactured piece of it is uh, you should definitely be looking uh, very early at who the other partners in the ecosystem are likely to, who, who they're likely to be. And that may not be like a cynical thing. That may be like, it behooves me to choose those people I know who will maintain a certain level of quality for the developer experience. Does that make sense? So if I, if I only associate uh, this movement or if I specifically ask them to you know, speak to this or speak around this problem or opine and offer their ideas around this. Um, in the end, I also know that they're going to be very, very dedicated to providing a, 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 a very decent like developer experience, right? And that, that's, 
there's folks who in many cases are not willing, like they start building up these large platforms and they have these kind of marketplaces, but um, in some cases they are not willing to um, have like recommended players um, in different parts of the marketplace. And I, I kind of think that if you are the, the platform builder and you're the one that is kind of like hosting a lot of this ecosystem, you should pick out the best possible experiences for your developers. Like you should be okay with curating what is the best. Uh, you can either do that like via very strong curation and an internal team doing that, or you can do that via let the community speak and tell you and vote up whoever is you know doing the best job at whatever database management or whatever. Right. So I guess the the analogy, I guess, you know, if we think about like a party, right, it's it's sort of you can create a good party by making sure the people you're inviting are the right people. But you don't necessarily make a party better by just throwing a ton of money at the party. Right? I think that's kind yes. of what you're yeah. saying. Um, are, are you seeing that happen, by the way? Are you seeing in today's era where people are raising so much, you know, ungodly sums of money? Are you seeing money being deployed in attempts to create movements the wrong way or when there shouldn't be movements created or is it um i think that there's like you know I, you can tell when somebody is very you can tell when somebody is trying to force it um, and it, it's usually because they're using a lot of the like, traditional comms and marketing tactics to do it um so they might send the the like they might send out something or honestly put out a New York Times like full page advertisement with a bunch of co-signers against um, this is wrong or, or, or this is how things are going. Uh, but at the like ground level, uh, they, they have no ground game, right? Like there's just nobody talking about it in, um, in, in like the different communities that they could possibly be talking about it in. And, and there's no like, vibrant slack channel of people like chatting about it all it is is you bought a full page ad in the new york times like that's great mm -hmm. it's not <laughs> so let, let's 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 talk a little bit about the substance of these movements right is, is this you know and i i apologize for the dumb question but do these movements no. consist of just people talking or do these movements consist of open source communities or or conferences or swag like you know so what is you know what do like what does it actually consist of other than messaging and you know is it, is it, yeah. does it have to revolve around a code base does it have to revolve in a marketplace like is it, there have to be something tangible um i mean i think it it so it's something it's kind of like you look back i like i i honestly in going through this presentation was looking back at it and i was like oh yeah DevOps didn't used to be a thing like and it wasn't or, and what DevOps encompasses wasn't necessarily respected or uh, in the same way that it is today right like the, I guess these movements are you look back on it and you're like this is ubiquitous now this is the way that people work now and it, before it was just like you were you know, you were in like the QA cave or something like that. I don't know. Uh, so, uh, Matt, but you know, the pieces it that it consists things. of. Yeah. Like, yeah. I, I, like, like I, I think of it as two pieces, but maybe, I, I mean, I, I don't have, you know, a fraction of the experience you have with this. Like one of them is giving it a name. That seems to be a very important part of the, just the act of naming yes. the movement and, and making these forgotten developers not forgotten anymore is a big part of the equation here. And at least pre-pandemic, I used to associate a lot of this with conferences where you were gathering, you'd given something a name and then you know people can sort of raise their hand at least mentally and say, yeah, I'm part of that thing. That, that name speaks to me. You know, and then the conference was an opportunity for those forgotten developers to not be forgotten and to, to stand up and be counted within this group of people that Oh yeah, I'm not the only one with this problem, or oh, I'm not the only one that thinks this is the solution to the problem that I have, right? And that it was also then be, it became a way for them to go back to their organizations or their teams with backup that like, 
the rest of the world agrees with me that this is how we should solve this. And that's helpful because then if you're selling a tool that allows it or that makes it easier, you've given the person who's supposed to drag your tool into the organization additional ammunition with which to do that. Yeah, yeah. Um, um, and it doesn't need to happen in a conference. Like you can see it before the con, like before spending, you know, tons and tons of money on, on building that out or whatever with your broader community. Um, you know, I've seen it done in smaller ways um, that have scaled very well, right? Uh, Meteor, for instance, had like these Meteor show and show and tell nights, right? And so it was these, this opportunity for Meteor developers to show off their different projects that they were working on. Um, it also, so it, it both kind of created a little bit of, of hero making and a little vanity of heel for those that were working within the Meteor community, but it also, um, allowed the Meteor, um, you know, Meteor, the commercial entity, um, this opportunity to show off like some of the capabilities and edge cases and functionality that were, that you could really build out. Um, what they did was pretty brilliant in that they basically build an, a, an ambassadorship in a block. So they started getting um, folks in Israel, folks in um, Germany, um, folks all over the world asking them, we, we'd like to demo at our media, a meteor night. Um, and so they basically just built a meetup in a box and would send like 200 bucks to whoever was going to be the organizer to pay for pizza and beer. And um, it proliferated into more than a hundred global meetup events, um, all talking about meteor. And I think honestly, sneak might actually be in that category as well. I think they really do have that kind of distributed ambassadorship. So when people start seeking you out to talk about their best practices and their um, ways that they can educate your community and, and they're like that level of engaged, that is a huge indicator that you are really, really onto something, right? And you just kind of have to figure out what is the right mechanism to um, continue to push that forward and to really encourage those people who are that die hard about working with you. Yeah, a, a lot of what you're talking about, I think it seems like it boils down to community and creating a currency of, of reputation or validation, right? Where like the act of naming something, the act of gathering the community creates an opportunity for, for, for validation of, hey, the problem I'm experiencing and the solution I, I, I propose or the way I, th I want to solve it is, I, I've, got some, I've got some currency of validation that this community is creating for me that I can then use, I can then, you know, by, by showing off how I've solved it in one of these meetups, for example, it, it, it's a way of getting that currency of validation to self-perpetuate. And yep. that, that and may be what the fuel of this, this is. Yeah. You know, I, th I think there's also just like, yeah, the the value of discovery from those like larger communities and and from having being able to talk to that many people um, who are very engaged in, in these particular problem areas, it just makes for better product development. It it mm. it very much isolates like core features very early on. Um, it allows you to like. Um, iterate around that and and you suddenly have a, a ton of built-in alpha testers who will help you and who take some ownership around the work that you're doing. Um, it's really an interesting kind of phenomenon. You've, you've, you've touched on this a little bit, but I, I kind of want to zero in on this because a lot of the, the founders listening to this are early stage and have sort of limited budgets. Can this be done on the cheap? Is it worth doing if you've only raised yeah. a few million dollars? Yeah, I mean, I think it can be done. It has mostly been done on the cheap <laughs> to start, I would mm -hmm. say. Um, I think, you know, be, you may want to coin a term, right? But like first, look at the look at the core developers that you know you're going to, who have the problem that you're, you are trying to solve. Go to those communities and and talk to them as much as possible and try to help them solve their problems. Um, it may not even be with your commercial product as the endpoint for the solution, uh, but just get in there and start um, talking to them. Begin to build up more trust because you've been a good citizen within those other communities, and then you can decide whether or not you can then 
pull people within that community to um, join with you in coining some term, building out some, the next evolution of whatever it is that you're building out. Um, it, Definitely be, because it needs to be so organic, it, it actually, it requires a lot of the founder's time. You know, oh, it yeah. can't be it can't be outsourced to some junior hire. It has to be done by oh yeah. Yeah. And, and you should be doing that anyways as an early stage founder because you need to be listening to what, you know, when you're thinking about what your core features look like and when you're really sort of like figuring out what the package is going to be for the first for the for commercial product, um, you need to be chatting with as many people as possible anyways, right? And so that might be people that are like that you're trying to hard sell, but more often than not, you're talking to people who seem like they fit in your target customer base and asking them about all their problems and and the tooling that they're currently using and the budget that they're currently paying against that and, and all of that, so. Cool. Um, one final question. Um, you mentioned briefly no code and low code, um, yeah. <laughs> which I think are, I'd love to get your take on, on how this works for those communities because they're, yeah, there are movements, but they're very different in a lot of ways. Um, we've got a number of companies that are sort of low codey or even no codey. How have you seen them approach the movement building thing? Um, a lot of their target users are less accustomed to these sorts of efforts, these sorts of communities, you know? Yeah. Um, I mean, I think it's probably just like, it, again, broadening the the definition of developer. Um, and, you know, I think there are going to be hardcore people who have been coding since they were 13 years old and self-taught and whatever, who can scoff at that. But uh, <laughs> these people actually being able to do their work well without being uh, gated by uh, engineering time or whatever actually makes everybody's lives easier. Um, as far as the com broader community is concerned, uh, I mean, there's communities of people who have been talking about their problems and solutions for a very long time. Uh, it It is not just a hardcore dev thing, right? Like, there are large communities of breast cancer survivors who are talking about uh, their value uh, or uh, the different values that they've gotten from different types of products and the um, different solutions that they've had and education around that. Um, it's not, it's dev community is very much adjacent to just community, right? Like. Very cool. So we got a great question from Peter from Sovereign, and he was asking, how do you find early adopters within developers? What if they have a problem, um, but are not yet searching for a tool to solve it? Um, I guess, I mean, you kind of have to validate that the problem is big enough, right? Um, it may, this is, I mean, Gil, you can probably talk to this as well, where you're like, are you a feature or are you actually a real product? Um, mm -hmm. Uh, like if somebody has a problem, but it's just a slight problem, it's a mosquito and not like a huge problem, um, then, you know, I, I yeah. Uh, but I, th I think what Peter's getting at is if the problem is there, but it's not something that they, that they are actively searching for either because they don't, if they don't know what to call it or they don't think it's solvable. Uh, that's just what's yeah. always been done. It's a massive headache, but it's just part of life. So, you know, how do you, I, I think his question is, how do you break in yeah. to people's awareness when, when like assuming, assuming there is a big problem, otherwise, if there isn't a big problem you're solving, then you're, you're screwed anyway. But if assuming you're solving a big problem, but there are these issues where like, okay, the problem is enormous, but no one knows they have it or no one, no one thinks to try to solve it. They're just so accustomed yeah. to it. They live with it. Yeah. Um, I mean, I guess, like uh, Edith has done a good job with uh, with this. Um, I mean, she used to go in and when people were like, okay, I need this feature flagging thing. How do I do this? She would go through the super long ass explanation of how she was going to build, some, like how you would build this out in a, you know, scalable and reliable way. And then at the end, she'd be like, or you could just pay us. Right. Like it'd be like, I will lay out exactly how you do this in house. Like you want to know and, and and you're set on building this in house. Like, here's how you do it. 
but I mean, there's like a large number of people where if that is not their core products, they're going to realize like partway through getting started on this, how hard and unwieldy this is, is and, and how terrible it's going to be to maintain this. And then there's this opportunity for you uh, just to be the person that ment- maintains that and to owns that and who owns that and right. is the domain expert on that very like sharp pain, right? Cool. Uh, awesome. Dana, thank you so much. That was awesome. Um, and uh, I, I think you've, you know, it's funny because you're talking about software movements has actually given given a name to something that we talk about a lot. So so it, there's a, uh, um, it, it, for, for me at least as a, as, as, a, as a VC, it's an example of what I think you're talking about. By, by, by naming this concept of, you know, uh, building a movement, um, you're, you're collecting a bunch of ideas together that I think we we talk about these ideas separately with our companies. And I think- Sure, yeah, sure. From, from now on, I'm just gonna say, look, you need to build a movement. Go watch this podcast and talk to Dana. <laughs> but, Wait, um, but no, but you are part of it now because we're doing yeah, no, this we're, whole thing we're together. We're in the movement, exactly. It's a community. Where this, is, it, this is happening. Exactly. We've made an opinion. Right. Now everybody right. send things into this thing and tell right. us where we're wrong or what we should do more of or what, yep. what where they can be leaders. Um, okay, Absolutely. we're in it. Thank this you. is a, a pact. Thank you so much <laughs> for this. Um, and uh, I, I really can't speak highly enough about heavy bit. Um, uh, people who know me know I don't recommend too many VC funds, but they really are awesome. Um, and I think a lot of that, that awesome has to do with the authenticity of passion that they bring to this very specific kind of company that they back. Um, and so uh, we, we, we do hope to do it, do it, uh, um, and invest together soon. And again, Dana, thank you so much for doing this. Yeah, thanks. Thanks so much. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Thanks. Thanks.